May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> My soul magnifies the Lord. So begins the Song of Mary, often called the Magnificat. These are ancient words, one of the earliest hymns of the Christian community, used in the secret gatherings of early Christians. These are familiar words, having a place in all Eastern and Western Christian liturgies for centuries. A singer in an Anglican collegiate or cathedral choir can sing hundreds of settings of this text during Evensong in just a few years. Here we find ourselves hearing these familiar words on the verge of Christmas with its own familiar but sanitized story of the baby in the fresh straw of the manger surrounded by peaceable animals with a gentle mother who has been through labor and yet who is fine and ready to welcome the shepherds. Familiarity is a dangerous thing. When texts and stories are familiar, we can repeat them by rote, missing the subtleties and the challenges to which familiarity has immunized us. Our gospel this morning should shake and awake us. It focuses on Mary, a young, probably barely teenaged girl, unmarried, a member of a very much secondary gender of an oppressed people, whether under the control of her father, her betrothed, or her husband, she would never have power to make her own life decisions. As a Jew, she was looked down upon by the Roman occupiers. She was as close to being a non-person as she could be. And yet, in this context, an angel appears to her with news that would have been disquieting at best. She was to become pregnant out of wedlock. If she were to marry Joseph, and he were dis to discover that she was not a virgin, a logical conclusion if she were pregnant, her punishment according to Deuteronomy was to be stoned outside her father's home. Shame and derision would be her lot in the brief time before she was violently and horribly killed. Yet, knowing all this, she humbly accepts. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. When she is three months pregnant, at the time she would probably begin to show and scandal would descend, she travels to visit her cousin Elizabeth, a woman who is miraculously pregnant past the age of childbearing. It is in the context of Elizabeth's recognition of the reality of what Mary's pregnancy means that Mary begins her song, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, The song of Mary is the oldest Advent hymn. It is at once the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. The song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of some of our Christmas carols. It is instead a hard, strong, inexorable song about collapsing thrones and humbled lords of this world. During the dirty war waged by the military junta of Argentina against its own population, more than 9,000 civilians, including pregnant women, were abducted and killed by the regime. The mothers of these disappeared put the words of Mary on their protest posters as a cry for justice and human rights, incensing those in power and leading the government to ban the display of Mary's words. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has sent the rich away empty. This is not Mary meek and mild. This is Mary as a strong prophetic voice. Mary's passionate, wild, revolutionary song 
is the longest passage attributed to a woman in the entire New Testament. We need to hear her song as if for the first time. This song is Mary's vision, her prophecy, that things will be made right by a radical upending of the status quo. As for her, no longer will she be unseen, unregarded, and unheard. All generations will call her blessed. This has nothing to do with her own merit. She acknowledges that this is the result of God's actions in her life. She proclaims God's mercy and faithfulness to those who love him. She also issues a call to embrace the coming of God's kingdom with all that means. God will spoil the plans of the proud, unseat the mighty and powerful, and send the rich away hungry. God will exalt the humble and the powerless and will care and provide for the poor and the hungry. Mary's world was filled with injustice. The Romans had conquered the kingdom of Israel and made it into a satellite state of Syria. Punishment for crimes against the empire was swift and brutal public execution. Jewish uprisings were met with overwhelming force, such as the destruction of the city of Sepphoris in 4 BCE. According to the historian Josephus, Sepphoris, a city near Jerusalem, where early tradition held that Mary was born, was burnt to the ground by the Roman governor of the region, and the people were sold into slavery. The occupiers distrusted and looked down on the Jews. Within Israel, and under religious law, women had no agency to act on their own behalf and lived their lives wholly under the control of men. If they were widowed, they were reliant on their sons for support. If they had none, the mercy of their husband's brothers. They were often left destitute. The occupiers oppressed the Jews. The Jews oppressed women. Those who were at the top of the social structure had all the advantages, and everyone else had little, if any, power. Mary's song is revolutionary in a moral sense. The devisings and the plans of the proud are set at naught. We must not equate our accomplishments or our worldly substance with God's approval. We must be willing to set aside our plans so that we can strive to do what God calls us to do. Mary's song is revolutionary in a political sense. Those in power are to be unseated. We must stand up for those who are oppressed or treated unjustly because their lives matter. God's love is for all. No one who is loved by God is worthless, and we owe it to all to respect the dignity of every human being. Mary's song is revolutionary in an economic sense. The message is that God respects, lifts up, feeds, helps, and remembers those who are in poverty. We are called to care and to minister to the poor of all the earth, to ensure that they are treated as the cherished children of God that they are. The very incarnation of Jesus is the first act of God in turning the status quo upside down. The mother of Jesus was to be a poor, unmarried Jewish teenager, not a woman of power or prestige. The second person of the Trinity would put aside his station and become a vulnerable human child. It is no wonder that the members of the early church, persecuted and often killed for their faith, identified with this canticle so strongly that it was incorporated into their daily worship. It assured them that God's kingdom was diametrically opposed to the empire in which they lived. But the message was not just for first century Palestine or for the early church. It is for us, maybe now more than ever. Our world is also full of injustice. There are many who are poor, who live in dreadful conditions without food or clean water. There are many who are sick, 
who do not have access to the health care they so desperately need. There are many who are homeless, some of whom served our country in the military and returned to lives of despair, not honor. There are many who are victims of a system that oppresses, even kills them. There are many who flee from countries where violence, political corruption, or famine place their lives daily in danger, just as the Holy Family fled from Herod. There are many who are marginalized, discriminated against, demeaned, degraded, feared, vilified. These are some of the many, all made in God's image, whose lives, whose very existence is devalued by this world. And there are those in our world who are blinded by selfishness, power, greed, or a total lack of empathy who could do something to remediate these conditions, but who do not do so because they feel they deserve to be rich, in charge, and on top. They enjoy the feeling that they are better than others. We, as Christians, cannot be blind either to our privilege or to the needs of the dispossessed of humanity. If we are honest, we must recognize we are the proud. We are the powerful. We are the rich. But we have a choice. We can choose to align ourselves with the proud, the powerful, and the rich. Or we can choose to be those who fear and love and follow God, those on whom God's mercy rests. We can choose to be lowly in spirit, not valuing ourselves above others. We can choose to hunger for those things that have eternal value. We can choose to participate in the reordering of the world in conformance with God's economy. We can embrace the kingdom of God envisioned by Mary. We can lift up the poor. We can feed the hungry. We can love and help all of God's children, the poor, the starving, the sick, the homeless, the immigrant, the disenfranchised, the oppressed, of whatever color, regardless of gender, orientation, or identity. We can speak truth to power when they engage in unjust, cruel, oppressive, or discriminatory acts against any of God's children. We can upend our own values to align ourselves with the eternal value of God's sacrificial love for humanity in our hearts, in our actions, and in our lives. Do not let the warmth and beauty of this season dull the sharp edges of Mary's song. Do not brush aside these words these challenging, upsetting, radical, revolutionary, subversive words. Ours is not a faith that calls us to be comfortable. Ours is a faith that wants us to be uncomfortable and to use our discomfort to stir us up to work as best as we are able for the coming of the kingdom of God. Amen. <laughs>